All right, victory in the resurrection. I wanted to preach uh, some positivity this morning, <laughs> you know, with uh, things we're going through. And I, uh, this, this chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, um, is really the resurrection chapter. It talks about us, you know, rising again. And, you know, there were people in the Corinthian church that were uh, denying the resurrection. So that's where you can see Paul addressing that and saying if the resurrection didn't happen, then our faith is vain. But, uh, you know, when you think about the resurrection, it's a good reminder to us that, you know, one day we will be victorious, right? We will, we will overcome. I mean, that is the ultimate, uh, you know, win, isn't it? I mean, what's the most they can do to you in this world is they can kill your body, right? And then Jesus rose from the dead to show that even the worst thing that could happen to you here we will overcome one day. We will, you know, we will rise again from the dead. So Jesus rising again from the dead reminds us of this victory. And we want to reflect on some of the things that uh, the resurrection makes us think of this morning. And hopefully that will encourage us. Uh, as we read in the last part of this chapter, you know, it talks about overcoming uh, you know, this world and, and resurrecting and saying, you know, you know, where death is swallowed up in victory. Like, we have this victory at the end. But look at how it ends. It doesn't end there with this great victory. It says, therefore, therefore, so because of these things, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So knowing that we will rise again from the dead, knowing that Jesus rose again from the dead, that ought to spur us to work for the Lord, to work, to fight, to strive. Hey, be consistent in that work because it will not be in vain. It will not be in vain. Sometimes you feel that way. Right? Sometimes you're working, you're striving, you're fighting, and you just feel like, what's the point of it all? Well, this chapter is to remind us that there is a point to it because as we work and we strive and we fight for the Lord's work, our labor is not in vain, knowing that one day we'll rise again, that there is an eternal life, that there is an afterlife to this, that it, that it builds towards. Right? Victory in the resurrection. So a couple of things to think about this morning. Number one is the resurrection reminds us that the Bible is true, that the Bible is true. I mean, it's the most powerful argument for the Bible. Like when I talk to people, even out soul winning, and you know, in the workplace, and just you know, discussing Christianity, I was talking with somebody in the in the Live Dems party recently, and we and he's a, an atheist. Um, he used to be a Christian, and we were talking about you know reasons why he got away from the faith, and then kind of got on the topic of this. And um, you know, I was talking about these things as well, and and I find that even the most reasonable of people. You know, you sort of start talking to them about, you know, the Bible. You start talking to them about the resurrection, the facts about the resurrection. And even the most reasonable people that I would have respect for, just in terms of how they reason and how they talk, you, you find that it ends up, there's other reasons why they, they don't want to believe the Bible, right? Because when it comes down to the facts of the, of, the, of, the, of the resurrection, they're hard to dispute. You know, it's hard to dispute the facts, and it's hard to provide an alternative explanation to those facts that really would um, explain uh, the things that we see in history, that we see uh, witnessed in the Gospels and in other uh, things. And, and I've preached on that sermon before. But we'll see in 1 Corinthians 15 that the resurrection really is a, a sort of quintessential part of Christianity. Like, it's a critical part. And Paul actually alludes to it here that if people were rejecting the resurrection then they're rejecting the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead and then our faith is vain because the gospel that we believe in is that we have eternal life through the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, what hope does it give us if Jesus just died and was buried and then he no longer existed? Right? There's no hope there. The hope is he rose again from the dead and therefore he goes into this chapter saying that one day we will also rise again with the same glorified body that Jesus Christ rose with. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So this is a good passage to 
have in your memory, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, because this is the clearest definition of the gospel in the Bible, right? The fact that we, Jesus died, was buried, and rose again according to the scriptures. And that's how we are saved. That's what we have to believe. And that he was seen of Cephas. So that's uh, Peter, the apostle. Then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. And that's a, that's a really critical claim there, because what Paul is saying here is he's not just saying that Jesus rose from the dead, he's naming out the witnesses, and not only was it the twelve, it was also more than 500 people, and he's saying that they're still alive while he's writing this. Right? So you can't actually make this claim while people are still alive and, and it can be verified. You can go and talk to these people. After that, he was seen of James. So James was one that, did, you know, um, that had disputed uh, who Jesus Christ was. But once he rose from the dead, like Paul, he had converted and was a believer. Then of all the apostles, so it shows that there's more apostles than just the, the 12. So there's 70 of them, They're the ones that were ordained and sent and had power to you know, lay their hands on people and, and uh, pass those, that gift of the Holy Spirit on. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I mean, Paul is a perfect example of somebody that did not have an ideal past. I mean, he didn't have an ideal past and he, and he ki even killed Christians. And it just goes to show that if God can use Paul, I mean, surely he can use us. Right? If God can use Paul to do, to be the greatest, uh, the greatest apostle that there was, you know, wrote half of the New Testament, surely he can use us who have not you know, committed such grievous things as Paul. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So you see there that illusion that Paul is addressing this problem in the Corinthian church that people were disputing that Jesus Christ, well, that people rise from the dead, right? So he's saying that if you're, if you're denying the resurrection, and we see even in the Gospels how the Sadducees say that there was no resurrection. That's why they say, well, in the resurrection, you know, if, if, a, if a woman marries one man and he dies and marries the next one, you know, they're trying to create this scenario to say, well, look how stupid the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? Uh, and then he corrects them and says, you don't, you err uh, not knowing the scriptures because in the resurrection, we're no longer married, right, in the resurrection because marriage ends at death, doesn't it? So, he says here, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? So that's the problem. If there is no resurrection, then how did Jesus rise from the dead? And this was the gospel, that Jesus died and rose again from the dead. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Vain, what does vain mean? It means it doesn't profit. right? It doesn't do you any good. Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. So Paul is referring to himself, saying, if Jesus, if there's no resurrection, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, and then therefore we're not witnesses of Christ, we're false witnesses of Christ, because we're saying that Jesus died, rose again, and we saw the risen Christ. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, Ye are yet in your sins. So you can't, you can't reject the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the bodily resurrection, and be saved, right? You need, to, you need to believe that he rose again from the dead because how can you be saved and have that hope if you don't even believe Jesus rose from the dead? And this is what he is saying here. If Christ be not raised, verse 17, your faith is vain, right? Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ does you no good. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. So saying also those who have already died believing on Jesus Christ, they're gone too. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. Right? Because we put our faith, why, why are we most miserable? Because the more you lean on something, the harder you fall. It's like the more you trust somebody, 
Isn't it hurt more when they betray you or they, they don't stand with you, right? So imagine us. We're, we're believing 100% on Jesus Christ, right? When we, if, they, if that's not true, I mean, we are more men, most miserable because most people are not putting their trust in a saviour. They're putting their trust in their self, right? And they, so, they, they, or they might have a combination there. So, the resurrection reminds us that the Bible is true. And like I said, it's one of the most powerful arguments for the truth of the Bible. Um, because when we look at the facts, you know, the fact that Jesus died, you know, we, we verify from history that J Jesus died. His tomb was empty, so his body could not be found. His enemies were saying that the body was stolen. That's evidence that the body was not found. And then the rise of the early witnesses. Now, I usually say to people that if the resurrection didn't happen, then Christianity wouldn't have come to pass. Right? Because what would have made the disciples so zealous about saying that Jesus rose again if they didn't see him? Right? It's one thing to believe, to be, to be told that Jesus rose again from the dead. But they weren't saying that. They weren't dying saying that I heard that Jesus rose from the dead. They died saying we were eyewitnesses. We were with him. We ate with him. You know, and then they, if they say, well, maybe they colluded, well, that wouldn't make sense of the people that weren't colluding with them, like James and Paul, right? They are saying the same thing, and they were enemies at the time. So what would make them want to collude and, and have no gain at all? So there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, very interesting things there. And if, if you brush up on that evidence and you brush up on that argument, that will serve you very well being a witness for jesus christ because sometimes we get caught up in either just explaining what the bible says or defending what the bible says but sometimes i find if you can talk about the resurrection and then say well this is why the bible has credibility because it's jesus right and jesus is a historical figure and who is jesus you know jesus is the one giving the bible credibility Right? then you don't have to really make the claim that the Bible gives credibility in and of itself right? because you have a historical figure of somebody that actually lived that there is witness about to say this is the credibility that because he preached the Bible as the word of God. So who is this man? Right? And the other explanations of these facts about the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they come short. You know, they, uh, just a few off the top of my head. Now, like one is the swoon theory, where the swoon theory is that um, people believe that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross and that he just fainted on the cross and then was put in the tomb and, you know, and somehow in his like, half-dead state he rolls the stone away and convinces his disciples to go preach that he rose again from the dead. Um, that's one. Another one is you know, hallucination, that they all happen to hallucinate the same thing, right? And then people know that you know, hallucinations are very inconsistent and no, no one person hallucinates the same thing. So it's, it's a very un, unreasonable explanation. And the one, another one I talked to you about, which was the collusion. So they just colluded and made it up. But a lot of the things that happened about Jesus happened publicly, you know, and, and uh, there were people that didn't like Jesus, like, like Paul is a good example, where you know, those things don't hold up. So what would make Christianity exist in the early church? What would make the early disciples be willing to die, testifying of what they saw for no earthly gain at all right what and what would make jesus's enemies say that he saw the resurrect they saw the resurrected jesus so it leaves you in this predicament is jesus who he said he was or was he a complete liar now most people will not go to that extreme that jesus is a complete fraud and he's just fraudulently you know put this uh thing into the world that everyone believes now most people would uphold Jesus as a good and moral teacher, right? And that's why they put themselves in a predicament. Because if you, if you believe Jesus is a moral teacher, aren't you going to believe the things that he taught? Right? The things that he taught is that he was the son of God, that he was God in the flesh, that he came and he died on the cross for your sins, and that there is one way to the Father. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, he says in John 14. Right? So the resurrection really is... Uh, one of the best arguments um, in terms of testifying of the truth of the gospel. What is another thing that the Bible reminds, uh, that the resurrection reminds us of? This victory that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds us not to live in fear. Not to live in fear 
You know, that's what, the, that's what the government wants us to live in, right? Just fear, fear, fear. Because if they can make you scared of everything, then, then you'll give up your freedom, right? Because safety and freedom are a balance, right? Whereas you, you can't, the more safe, safe you are, the less, less free you are, right? And the more scared you are, the more you're willing to give up your freedom, and that gives the government more power. That's why they've always operated that way. They scare you to give up your freedom, but... The resurrection reminds us, wait, we don't have to live in fear, right? That's why where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Because you can know Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus overcame death, you don't have to live in fear. Fear is a very powerful feeling. It's a very powerful force. It stops you from fulfilling your full potential. You know, like you are so, so capable of so many things. You know, like imagine what, like what the human body can do, what the human mind can do. Like if you put your mind to something, like you will surprise yourself what you're capable of. You know, if you're just consistent in doing it, you'll look at yourself 10 years later and you won't even recognize the person from 10 years ago. You see? But what stops you from becoming the person, the man, the woman, that God wants you to be. Sometimes it's fear, right? That's why the Bible says here in Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth in tr his trust in the Lord shall be safe. What is that? The fear of man, worried about what other people think. Fear of consequences. That, that doesn't, that they, the way you don't take risks Right? So we need sometimes to take risks in our life. No, no pain, no gain, no risk, no reward. But sometimes the fear of man brings a snare. It's like a trap. Stops you in your tracks. And you won't do what you are otherwise capable of. It's a shame. So the resurrection reminds us, hey, we don't have to be scared. We don't have to live in fear. You know, we can take risks because life is short. We're living for the eternal. We're not living for the now. You know, we only have one life to live. I mean, there, you know, the fact that life is short and we have eternity in perspective, there's not much time to really accomplish things. You know, and people realize that. You know, I'm coming, I'm coming up, you know, I was talking with a mid-40s person recently. We're talking about, oh, midlife crisis, you know. Like, oh, that's why, that's when, they, you know, they just go and... Uh, guys, you, you get your midlife crisis, that's when you stop caring, right? You go, you know what? I've lived half my life, you know, I'm taking the risk now, it's doing the thing I wanted to do. You know, I'm going you know, to give up this dead end job that I hate doing, whatever, I'm going to do something I enjoy or do something I want to. But you know what? We ought to have that mindset, you know, and obviously there's a balance there of, you know, being wise about it, but, but striving for something more than just mediocrity, you know, striving for something greater. You know, for the sake of God and for the sake of Christ. Fear of man brings a snare. Matthew 10, look what Jesus said. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Why don't we have to fear them that are able to kill the body? Because of the resurrection. Jesus rose again, showing he overcame that. That's why we don't need to worry about those things. Now, in our flesh, obviously, we... We fear, and that's why it's, it's always a battle, right, between the spirit and the flesh. You know, but today's sermon, I'm trying to get the spirit a bit stronger here. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Right, and you can be motivated to obey the Lord out of reward, out of and you know, sermons I'm talking about today, be reminded of the truth and overcome that. But one way you can overcome fear as well is to fear something greater than what's making you scared. You know, sometimes you're scared of something, but if something greater you're more fearful, of, more fearful of, will get you to be less fearful of the thing that you're currently scared of. I know, currently have fearful. And Jesus is alluding to that solution here. So yes, you may be fearful of what man can do to you but in perspective you ought to fear what god can do right and that ought to guide your actions more so than the fear of man james 2 look at what here says even the devils are fearful of god thou believest that there is one god thou doest well 
the devils also believe and tremble and tremble. I try and remind my kids of this and you know because obviously children and people maybe are fearful of monsters in the closet or things that go bump in the night and you want to remind them that hey you know what your saviour the Lord Jesus Christ they are scared of him right and he is with you you don't need to be scared of them because they are scared of him. Matthew 8 let's uh, see an example of uh, we see spirits these are devils responding to the very presence of Jesus Christ. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, they met him too, possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. So you can see that as Jesus walked this earth and he came across those possessed with devils, they trembled at his presence, worried that the time had come for them to be tormented. And they would rather go and possess pigs and run off a cliff than to deal with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the sort of God we serve. That's the sort of God that protects us. And that is the God that came in flesh and rose again to remind you not to fear death. 1 John 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Right? So you don't believe everything you hear. Right? When you think about spirits, remember spirits, yes, there, there is an unseen side to that, but uh, often the time, the way spirits, kids, hey, Simon, Simon, stop talking, okay? You guys are there sitting and just talking the whole time. Sometimes we don't always believe everything we hear when it comes to spirits, right? When it comes to spirits, how does it operate with the physical world? You know, oftentimes the way a spirit operates in the physical world is it's by words. And that's why how does that's why when we you know people talk about words being powerful, words move the soul. That's because that's the that's the manifestation of spirits in this world. That's what I believe. Like the word of God is the spirit of God, the manifestation of God's spirit in this world to us is we hear that spirit. And that's why when you hear the negative influence, you wonder what spirit has put those words into the world, whether it's spirit of discouragement, bad ideas, you know, you know temptation, things like that, you know, false doctrine. This is what this is talking about here, that you just don't believe every spirit because false doctrine can lead to these things. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Right. So this is one good way to know whether the spirit that you're listening to is of God, because that spirit will confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard, that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye of God, little children, have overcome them. Look at this, and this is why I'm reading this passage. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Right? So Jesus rose again from the dead, overcame the world, and that spirit of Christ dwells in us. We don't need to live in fear. Right? Because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Right? Number three. Number three, the resurrection reminds us we have victory in the resurrection that we can overcome. We can overcome. So we don't only are able to overcome in the next life. Right? Because you don't want this defeatist attitude that yeah, maybe I'll resurrect one day and get that victory that's spoken about in 1 Corinthians 15. 
But the resurrection reminds us that you can have victory today as well. You can overcome fears. You can overcome sin. You can overcome challenges that God puts in your way or that the world puts in your way because we can overcome just like Jesus overcame, right? So it's that encouragement that we have what's in us, the power to overcome these things if we walk in the Spirit. John 16, 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So you see here that Jesus is not saying here that once you're saved, that you're not going to go through tribulation. Right? He says you will go through tribulation. Right? But then this is the right mindset we have as we go through this tribulation, that Jesus has overcome the world, right? So we can still have joy even though we go through tribulation. And that's, that's one part of overcoming tribulation. It's not just, you know, not going through it. That doesn't mean necessarily overcome it. It could be that that tribulation, that those hard times do not take away the joy that God has given you, right? That's one way you can overcome tribulation because one way that tribulation affects us is that it gets us down. It makes us quit. It discourages us. But the resurrection reminds us we don't have to be discouraged. We still win in the end. We can have joy and continue through and be patient through tribulation. Don't let that tribulation stop us from moving forward. So one way we overcome is by being saved. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. This is where the song, you know, faith is the victory comes from. It's this passage. So this is the passage that would have inspired that hymn, no doubt. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So you see, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you overcome the world the world right you because you you're saved just by being saved you overcome the world that's one way why because the world doesn't want people to get saved the world's trying to convince you that the bible is not true the world's trying to convince you that jesus is not who he said he is the world's trying to convince you that evolution is true and therefore the bible's not true and all these other things that god's god's a monster the bible's inconsistent blah 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 that's the world right the world is trying to convince you otherwise when you get saved and you say, you know what, no, I do believe on Jesus Christ, I do believe the Bible, you overcome that spirit, right? That, that world that is trying to keep us not saved. 1 John 2, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because you have known the father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. So not only do we overcome the world, right? The, the false, you know, the world telling us that the Bible's not true. Kind of overcome the lusts of the world. Remember we talked about worldliness, the lusts of the eyes, lusts of the flesh, the pride of life. We also overcome our number one adversary, Satan. Right? We overcome the wicked one. And 1 Corinthians 10, what else can we overcome? We can overcome, like I talked about, just the temptations in our own life. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that, that ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So the fact that you are going through a tribulation or a temptation, that means you have the ability to overcome it. Now that doesn't necessarily mean you have the ability in your own power, right? Because he says he will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But this is not just in your own power, right? It says here, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it, right? So it means that there is a way to overcome this temptation. You may not find it in yourself to be able to overcome it, but God will help to provide that escape. 
And do you have your eyes open? Are you willing to obey when you hear his voice? Not to fear death. Number four. The resurrection reminds us, so we talked about not fearing man, not to live in fear. But one thing people fear of is just death itself. Right? Not to fear death. They fear that their life is just over. That this is all there is. They're worried about when they die. They're worried that it's all going to be over. And the resurrection reminds us that at death, that's not when it's over. Right? It's not over at death. And if you will really reflect on that and think about that and, and apply that to yourself, that should make you live differently, as it says in, in uh, Peter's epistles. Right? That if you know that the resurrection is true, you know that there is an afterlife, you know that there's an eternity after, that, after this, that ought to make you live differently because it's going to shift your priorities. Right? If you only believe this life is all there is, right? You will live a different way to if you believe that there is treasure being laid up in heaven for you, for the things you do in this life. Right? Not to fear death. Jesus rose again from the dead. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. In Revelation 2, he says, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things, saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. So Jesus was dead and is alive. We don't have to fear death because once we take our last breath on this, on this earth, we will be in heaven. We don't actually ever experience real death, which is our soul descending into hell. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe this? And first of all, you have to believe it to be saved. But if you believe in an eternal life, you believe in an afterlife, are you living like you believe in an eternal life? Because you know what? A lot of people say they believe in eternal life, but you see the way they live. Do you really believe it? You know, do you believe that there is a life after this? If you do, why do you invest so much of your time, money, and resources building up treasure on earth? You know, establishing yourself here. Sure, you need to, that's a, that's a necessity, but we go over the top, don't we? Right? How do we spend our life and our time? If we believe there's an eternity, let's live like there's an eternity. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others, which have no hope. Right? So even in the way we mourn about death of people that have died in the Lord Jesus Christ, that should change too. If we believe in eternity, that we believe in a resurrection. And this is what Paul is saying here. That yes, he's talking about them who are dead will rise again. And he's saying, because they will rise again, don't sorrow over them like people that have no hope. Right? As though people that have no hope. Now, obviously, if they have, that person is not saved, you probably should have sorrow over them like they have no hope. But the people that do, that are saved, we don't sorrow for them in the same way we sorrow for people that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. See how, notice how he links how we respond to people who have died in the Lord Jesus Christ physically. Links it, hey, if we believe that Jesus rose again, this is why we don't sorrow as others that have no hope. This is why if we believe the resurrection, we believe that we will die and rise again, that ought to change the way we live. Right? That ought to change us. Number five. Number five the resurrection reminds us. We have this victory in the resurrection. Hey, it reminds us that things will get better one day. No matter how hard life gets, no matter how bad the situation is, one day things will get better. Right? And that, and that ought to encourage us, not discourage us. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You see how you allow 
your heart to be troubled. That's why he's saying, don't let your heart be troubled. You know, it's like when people get offended, right? It's like, don't get offended. Well, you don't allow yourself to get offended. You know, it's like they say offense is, um, what do they say? Offense is taken, it's not given. Have you ever heard that? Because you can say something supposedly offensive, but the person doesn't have to receive the offense, right? So just like with being discouraged, being troubled, it says here, let not your heart be troubled. Right? Don't allow these things to creep in that are discouraging you. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there you may be also. Right? Like sometimes these, uh, these passages, you know, we take... For granted, they're so familiar to us that we don't reflect on them. But sometimes these, these passages are good, that when you are downtrodden, when you are discouraged, when you feel like giving up, when you feel like all is vain, you know, you've got to think of these passages and be reminded, no, 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 your labour is not in the vain in the Lord, like we read in 1 Corinthians 15. So we've got to always be striving, fighting, and be consistent in serving the Lord. Romans 8, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. So you see how like, even though we're going through some hard times in this life, when we rem remember the resurrection, he's saying, because knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause, right? For, for this reason, like knowing that we will one day be raised again, we faint not, we don't give up, we don't quit. But though our outward man perish, right? Don't, even though the flesh feels like giving up, the spirit tells us to keep going. Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Right? So when we look to the heavenly things, we're reminded that should keep us encouraged. Revelation 21. This is uh, about heaven. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is like the ultimate passage of everything's going to get better one day. Yeah. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. Amen to that. So, last thought is, you know, this is why if the resurrection is true, one day life is going to get better in the afterlife. How should that make us live today? Right, well, we saw in 1 Corinthians 15, Hey, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for your work is not in vain. So the last thing I want the resurrection to remind us of today is, you know, we have that victory and it'll give us the right mindset, give us the right perspective. Now, action, right? Live in newness of life, right? Christians ought to live differently to how the world lives, right? It doesn't mean that everything in the world is bad, you know, there are some pleasures in this world and there's going to be some similarities between 
us and unbelievers. But there should, should be some stark differences between believers and unbelievers. One is in the way you talk. Right? The way you talk should be different. Unbelievers and believers. You know, believers don't curse and swear. Believers talk with respect. Believers talk with maturity. You know, believers talk seriously about things. You want, you want to be, there to be a difference between the way you talk. What about the things you talk about? That should be different too. I mean, believers shouldn't be joking about dirty jokes and all these things, participating in all that stuff, you know, making fun, you know, participating in bullying in the workplace or at school, these sorts of things. I mean, that's the sort of things you talk about, not just the way you say things. You know, what about the way you dress, the way you present yourself? You know, there's got to be a difference as well. You know, obviously the way the unbelievers dress may be more immodest, you know. So even for the guys now these days, more immodest, you know, in the way they dress and the way they do their hair and all that sort of stuff. So there ought to be a difference between believers and unbelievers. What about in your priorities? There should be a difference between believers and unbelievers. Obviously an unbeliever is going to sleep in on Sunday morning. Believers are going to prioritize the things of God. Right? Believers are going to do things differently in their life because of what they believe. Romans 6, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So you see here, that the resurrection ought to remind us we have victory, so now let's walk as victorious people. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So you see how the level of sin in a believer and an unbeliever's life should be different as well, right? Believers ought not to be just indulging in sin, just thinking that, well, you know, I'm saved anyway. No, we ought to walk in newness of life, right? And our life ought to be characterized as a less sinful life, right? In these sinful pleasures that the world may participate in, our life ought to be char characterized by a more sin-free lifestyle. Okay? So, just in summary, the Bible is true, not to live in fear, we can overcome. Not to fear death and things will get better and because we have victory in the resurrection, right? It's a good reminder, Jesus rose from the dead but the significance of that truth is not only to change our mind but it ought to impact the way we live. All right, so we've got to add, like James says, we've got to add works to our faith. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for Jesus dying and rising again for our sins. Not only for salvation, Lord, but the significance that it reminds us to walk in newness of life. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us to take this personally today. Lord, as we seek to live for you, we seek to live our lives. Help us have the right priorities. Help us to live a life of service to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.